All right, kicking off episode number 21, the risk of the beta mail, more specifically ending the beta mail. Sean's off this week uh, for Memorial Day weekend in the United States, so I'm joined by Rolo Tomasi. How you doing, Rolo? Hey, hey, good to be with you again. Yeah, it's good to see you back, brother. It's been a while since we've uh, collabed on anything. So uh, mm. show, this is something that you've written about, and I know you posted in the um, chat a couple of the articles and essays you've put out there. Mm. Um, and again, guys, the intent of the show, uh, just so we've got clarity as you're kind of, you know, piling into the, uh, notifications, uh, is to try to help you guys avoid making a train wreck out of your life. Um, you know, quite often guys will come to the red pill or come to look for solutions after they've experienced a trauma and more so than not, your spidey senses are going to tingle before something bad happens, before you make bad choices telling you, Hey man, you might want to. You know, be a little more attentive to this. You sure you want to do this? Is this going to lead to the kind of results you're looking for? Um, so what we'd like you guys to do when you call in, and I posted the call-in number there, it's uh, 323-642-1618. Again, it's over my shoulder, is to try to call in uh, to vet potential train wrecks that you might run into. Um, you know, so Rolo's got a ton of experience, you know, mm. in the space, especially when it comes to the sexual marketplace. Um, I'm happy to talk about stuff uh, around the sexual marketplace, even outside of it, but it's, you know, got to do with money or, or business or anything like that. Um, we're not exclusive to just uh, women or chasing tail here on this show. So uh, again, the number is 323-642-1618. If there's something you want to vet that might potentially lead to a plane, uh, to a plane wreck, a train wreck. <laughs> or, or a plane wreck. That'll, that'll work too. Yeah, try to avoid the plane wrecks if you can. Um, so Ending the beta, um, I see it as an important topic for guys to uh, digest simply because um, I think it's one of the main reasons why men go through the divorce machine and lose access to their kids while they watch money flow to their ex as she alienates them from the children, simply because she just gets fed up with the weak type of man that she is. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's quite easy for them to unplug. Um, you know, we know 70 to 80% of divorces are initiated by women. Um, it's easy for them to go through the process. Uh, they're able to optimize their hypergamous nature. And of course, you know, if, um, he, he doesn't take care of her because he's a deadbeat and the state will. So, um, there's always some way to come out of it a little bit better. So there's not a lot of incentive if she's stuck with some guy that she's not attracted to, to stay in that relationship. Um, actually, you know what, this would be a good segue into what kind of got you into the red pill with your brother-in-law. Do you want to tell that story? Oh, yeah, 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 sure. Um, I'm going to, I'm just about to put up a, a link here to a essay I wrote called betas in waiting. And, uh, that's a, actually a very good segue. Um, so one of the things people always ask me is like, well, Rolo, when did you get red pilled? You know, like as if it's a verb and, um, my, my sort of coming to the way that I think today or really kind of becoming who I am today. Um, it was a long kind of trek because I've gone through a lot of different phases in my life where like when I was in high school, I was kind of the nerdy beta kid. Um, then later on when I was in my early twenties, I was definitely an alpha um, sort of by default um, playing, you know, music in the LA metal scene of the late eighties and the early nineties. Um, got involved with a BPD girlfriend um, somewhere along the way in there. And that reduced me to, to somebody that I never thought I could become. Um, and then later on, uh, decided that uh, I, I needed to put myself first or um, discover. I, I didn't really call it mental point of origin back then. I just thought, you know what, I need to start thinking about me more than any other anybody else because I've got some catching up to do. And that was like my late 20s. And then I met my wife and we have uh, been together for tw going on 23 years. And um, I would say I'm a lesser alpha now if everybody wants to have some sort of, you know, clarification on, on what that is. So I've, I've been in a lot of different ways, I guess. And it took me some time to really learn about what being beta is. Right? I don't even want to call it beta so much. I like being blue pill by like what I always call blue pill conditioning. And there's a reason I call it conditioning is because from a very early age, um, our, our environment, our teachers, um, our culture, our media, um, our psychology um, influences us in what I would otherwise, you know, just for lack of a better term, term as blue pill, just like in the matrix, right? And so when you cut yourself away from that old way of thinking, that's where we get the idea of the red pill. So when I was more in a beta mindset, 
It was me following a lot of what that conditioning had taught me and to prioritize in my life and to influence me in what I should and should find acceptable as a direction for the way I go. And usually that's whatever works out for the feminine at that time. That's where I really came up with the idea of the feminine imperative because everything that, you know, we, we really since like the seventies or like since the sexual revolution, there's been this emphasis um, in culture to encourage men to get in touch with their feminine side, to identify more with the feminine, to support the feminine, to empower women. Um, this huge, huge social engineering project really is what I, I just term fempowerment, but all of that teaches us to believe things. It's almost like a religion, but it's, it's something that we are, it's constantly hammered home in our, our families, in our schools, in our popular culture. Um, to prioritize and to find whatever is in women's best interests as the correct way to think about things. So if I talk about like a feminine correct way or a gynocentric way or a feminine primary social order, that's what I mean right there. And so what happens is when guys are fed that and they're raised on that idea that they need to be more feminine sensitive, let's just say, um, and to prioritize women's priorities above his own and to sort of sublimate himself or sublimate his ambitions. When you're conditioning a man who's already predominantly beta to begin with, that's a real dangerous combination because it sets him up for failure. It sets him up for stumbling over his own dick, right? It, it sets him up for, for being, um, Sup supplicative, I guess, is the term I'm looking. Supplicating to to women, and uh, leaning into this idea that there's only there is only one person for him. You know, you got the soulmate myth. You've got all that other good stuff. Um, the you know one itis. Um, you you set yourself up to make her more by making yourself less. And we do that on so many different levels. Like when I talked with Pat, when I talk with Pat Campbell, I mentioned this a lot. Is You'll, you'll see these guys who are constantly self-deprecating. They, they believe that if they self-deprecate, that they lift their woman up that much more. So the first thing out of their mouths when they're talking about their wives or their girlfriends is they, they you know, bring themselves down by saying, you know, I, am, I, I can't believe she would go out with a schmuck like me because just look at me and look at her. And the guy, you know, that's the beta mindset, thinking that if she is more than I, and I am, if I am less, then that makes her more. And again, I'm using that as an example because that's the clearest way I can say uh, how guys get trained and conditioned, and it is a behavioral, psychological conditioning to to prioritize women and prior to prioritize their needs above his own. And that's why I always emphasize that um, uh, mental point of origin is something that guys really need to embrace once they become red pill aware so that they can use all of that awareness and all of the tools that they're learning from reading my stuff, you know, listening to your stuff, getting into, you know, understanding um, the, the realities of intersexual dynamics um, so that they can employ it and use it in their own lives, but they have to put themselves or they have to give themselves permission to get into that position in the first place. And that's a really tough spot. It's kind of where I wanted to begin with this is like, guys don't give themselves permission to be something more because they've been trained for a very, from a very early age to to think, like I said, that the lesser they are, the more that the woman is, and the more the woman will like them. It's a, it's identification game, and you've probably read that chapter in the first book about identification, um, or oh, is it identity crisis? Was the name of the uh, title of the chapter, and it's guys aligning their actual personalities in keeping with what they expect is a feminine correct way of thinking, and is going to ultimately result in them reproducing with a with a woman because they think that the more nicer they are, the more rapport they have, the the better, you know, all of this old social contract stuff, um, you know, the better the father they are, the better, you know, how everything that they do to make themselves the best version of themselves is not for themselves. It's because it puts them into a better standing with a woman or a potential woman if he doesn't have one. And so what happens is these guys get locked into this idea and it becomes even a religion to them. And that's why I, oh, I started the first book with um, the soulmate myth with um, there is no one. And I, I did that because that is the number one killer of men. 
And the reason I say that is because guys will get into this idealized relationship with a girlfriend or a wife and they make that one, they, they build a world around that woman rather than having a world for her to come into and own and control frame. They build a world around a woman and they build a frame for themselves around that woman because that woman is, they, they bought into the Disney idea that there's only one person for one person and you have to lift her up and she has to, you have to empower her and you have to be sensitive to her needs. You have to be a good listener and all this other crap that they tell you. And so what happens is the guy builds his identity based on that ideal, on the ideal woman, on the, 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 the soulmate, that that's the only one for him. And he literally cannot live without her. And that's what my brother-in-law did. My brother-in-law um, was with my my wife's sister. I'm, I got to clarify this because people get confused. It's the 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 first husband of my wife's sister, and the the women in my wife's family are very very attractive. And my wife is very attractive, and you've seen you've seen what Mrs. Tomasi looks like. Um, her sister is an absolute knockout, and always has been, and has always been very self centered and very. Um, very, I don't want to say vain so much because she's not exactly vain, but she's, she's very self-focused. If you want to talk about solipsism, she's got it. And mostly because she's been rewarded for being the good looking blonde, blonde hair, blue eyed, you know, uh, Miss America supermodel kind of look to her. And she ended up getting pregnant by her first boyfriend in just out of high school. And everyone thought he was going to bail. They thought he was going to leave her and that, that, you know, she's, she's knocked up. I came from a very religious family. So abortion was off the table. Um, and they all thought he was going to abandon it and, you know, uh, take off, but he didn't, he came back and he married her and he did the quote unquote right thing and built a life around her and put off all of his ambitions, put off all of his, um, his plans for the future with respect to like going to college and all this other stuff, because he now had a wife and a, well, it now, and at that time, a son to feed. And then later they had another daughter, but all through his twenties from the time he was like 19 or 20 years old, all the way up until his suicide at 40 years old. So we're talking a span of 20 years here. Um, he did his damnedest to, to do the best that he could with what he had. And to the point where he'd done fairly well for himself, they were taking trips to Hawaii when they, when they could. Um, but it was really by the sweat of his brow. It wasn't because he went to school. He had, did, you know, didn't major in anything, um, had a high school diploma. And that was as far as it went with him. But there was a, a big imbalance between himself and my sister-in-law, who is, if I had to say at the time they got together, she was easily a nine. And he was probably a seven, maybe. And so there was that imbalance in like sexual market value ratios there that was glaringly apparent to pretty much anybody that met them, but he did his best. He was a good guy. He tried to, and I'm not saying he was perfect. Okay. Um, he, you know, he had his ways about, it. he was very possessive and he was very possessive because he knew that she was more, you know, her sexual market value was well above his. So you get that mate guarding kind of thing comes out and that's usually that and most guys of a beta blue pill mindset who realize something like this, they become very possessive and they become very, and I don't, shouldn't just say men do this because women will do the same too. So if there's a, a guy who is like, say two steps above a woman's SMV and she's with them, she will end up being very possessive as well. It's mate guarding. Mate guarding is actually a cross gender. I think um, maybe men do it a little bit more because we're more interested in paternity. But in this case, um, he, that if he had a fault, it was his possessiveness that was that was at fault. So, flash forward to uh, about twenty years later, um, there uh, she. I won't tell you what she did because I don't want anybody to go tracking them down or anything like that. But um, she came into contact with a guy who was very very rich, uh, multimillionaire, and uh, let's just say they were in the tourism tourism industry at the time. And she ended up locking in with this guy and her kids were just about to go off to, well, one of them was already in college and the other one was like a senior in high school. And she decided at that point that her ship had come in and the guy that had spent the last 20 years building a life around them to the point where she was building or he was building a house literally with the, with his hands construction, building a house for them so that once the kids were gone, they could both sort of like, you know, semi retire to this place because he had had this idea that, 
he was going to live with her for the rest of his life. That was his soulmate, right? So um, what happens is once she decides that she doesn't want to have anything to do with him anymore, she wants to get with this other guy. Of course, that wasn't on the table at the time. We didn't find out till later that that was the case. But she was just saying, oh, I want to I want a divorce, blah, 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 which was really kind of bizarre to everybody because she had been very, very religious for, gosh, as long as I'd known her. And so all of that was out the tape, uh, you know, out the window at that point. And where I was, I was kind of like dumbstruck by it, but you know, my, my wife wants to be supportive. Her mom wants to be supportive. They want to, you know, they, they don't know what's going on, you know, either, but because it's family, they want to be supportive of it. And I'm just sort of watching this from, from the sidelines going, what the hell's going on? And after she announced that she wanted a divorce, um, they went to some counseling or something, but I think the counseling was really more to sort of clear her mind of the guilt that she was feeling because she wanted to basically jump ship to a guy who was a much better long-term prospect to her. And I thought it was really messed up. And here I am kind of in the middle of this and I don't want to get, and this is before I was writing and doing being rolled Tomasi, right? Um, and so about a week later, um, he decided that he was going to hang himself. And so he went to the property that he had been building and um, you know went out into the forest, uh, got a bucket and literally kicked the bucket, if you know what I mean. And so killed himself because the one thing that kept him together was being removed. He'd been, that's, that's the ultimate story, I think, of being zeroed out. That's why I, when I wrote zeroed out, which was only like maybe not even a year ago, I think, maybe a little over a year ago. Um, that's why I was so familiar with all of these stories of guys who, when they get go through a divorce and they they literally buy into the idea that they can't live without her. So whenever I see a guy who has killed himself or killed himself and his wife or killed himself and his kids and his wife, I know with within 90% surety that that what what has happened is the guy has been zeroed out and that's why i say that you need to kill the beta before the beta kills you and that's in the second or it's gonna be the first book as well uh it's important for guys to make a clean break is to like when you start learning red pill awareness and you you understand intersexual dynamics a little bit better it sort of ruins all of that old idealism and that old idealistic way of thinking that disney taught you and the village taught you and it's removing that one it's removing that soulmate idea away from you and i i even struggled with that too because i was of i you know i'm an artist right i mean i want to be i i i like to have my romantic soul you know sworn on my sleeve but then when i started after this experience i'm like this is bullshit. And the, another thing that really pissed me off too is that once he had hung himself and all of it was sort of, you know, cooling off a little bit, whenever I would relate the story um, to women who'd never even met my, my sister-in-law, they would instantly take her side. Mm -hmm. They would say, well, you know, she was ready to move on. Like I would explain, well, she decided she was going to go marry a very rich man after that. Pretty much even women who never met her before took her side. And that sort of opened my eyes to the sisterhood that if there is a hypergamous choice to be made by one woman, other women will pile on and reinforce that choice for her. Because uh, this is my theory is, is that because of our evolutionary, um, our evolutionary ancestry, let's just say in our hunter gatherer days, women used to have to rely on each other in in the encampment, right? In the tri in the tribal area while the men were off hunting. And so they had to learn to communicate differently than men did. They had to become more collectivist. I'm not gonna say communist or socialist, I'm gonna say they'd be more collectivist. And they had to learn to have some, some kind of an interdependence upon each other. And I really think that we see this a lot in how women automatically support other women and particularly so when it comes to hypergamous decisions for that woman. And that's what I was noticing when I would, and it really pissed me off. And I, I was pissed off because I didn't understand it then. And I'm like, this is fucked, you know? <laughs> and, and I, I, I didn't get it all the way through. And I was still kind of sorting these ideas out back then. Mm. Um, but the one thing that was impressed upon me is that I'd, he was, um, my, my brother-in-law was one of three guys that I know who have killed themselves over a girl. And I've also experienced, I also used to counsel a, a young girl, a young woman who 
when she was in her teenage years, she had um, quit her first boyfriend and got with another guy. And the first boyfriend ended up stabbing and killing the new boyfriend, thirty-two stabbed him 32 times. And that story sort of woke me up to the idea that guys will do pretty much anything for, for the woman that they believe is their soulmate. And so all of this is really kind of um, relates to how the blue pill conditioning can be very, very dangerous for guys. We keep hearing about incels these days. We keep hearing about... Um, Let me stop you there, Rolo, yeah. I want to make sure you know, we've got enough time for calls. Sure, sure, sure. I've learned by now that there's a time when I need to let you kind of like rock on with the experience. That's fine. <laughs> cut, cut in. Um, and that's a story that I wanted you to tell about mm. the risk of the of the beta male, because I don't think anything that I've heard or even seen myself encompasses uh, the reality and like the like frying pan to the forehead whack that you get when you hear that story. Because mm -hmm. I mean, like both you and I have talked to guys in the past that have um, either had a noose around their neck or a gun in their mouth, or they've got some version of it, mm -hmm. um, or a giant syringe of you know veterinary tranquilizer they're gonna you know jam in their thigh that's gonna put them out. So um, that's just from the sexual marketplace, you know, perspective when it comes to the interaction between men and women and the risk of, of uh, operating with a beta blue pilled mindset and how it can end you. Um, unplugging that from um, the interaction between men and women, and you can plug that same blue pilled beta mindset into things like um, stuff that business owners do, people that, mm -hmm. you know, things that people do within corporations. And it, it and it's universal in the sense that it is extremely dangerous to operate with that mindset, with that belief system, mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to being a man in this world, uh, because the, I mean, the fallout ain't good. And it's not mm -hmm. just, you know, you, you fall into one itis over a chick or something like that. There's a number of bad things that can happen. I've seen this happen mm -hmm. with entrepreneurs as well, you know, that travel. With right. Circles. So, yeah, I was going to say is like, and, and you know, this is that, that a, a beta or a, let's just say blue pill conditioned guy will make business decisions, life decisions, family decisions, any, it doesn't necessarily have to be romantic decisions, will make decisions based on that blue pill understanding that affect other men, that, that affect the men that he might be a partner with, or he might have, be an employer, and all of the, the employees are dependent upon him making the right choices, but those choices are made from a blue pill perspective, and it really cascades down into you know, the people that he knows. Yeah. And it's not just the employees, it's the, the vendors, the service. Well, providers. everybody. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Deal with the fallout. Um, we got a bunch of callers in the line. I usually try sure. to get to the callers within about 15 minutes to kick off once we kind of like um, do the intro talk. So we're going to get you guys on the line in just one minute. Uh, let me just go back over to the chat. I saw a super chat from Davi. So just real quick, guys, the way the chat works, if you're wondering why you can't chat, it's set to members only. And I do that intentionally to try to keep the trolls out. Uh, whenever I do a live broadcast, they're now members only simply because you get the trolls in there and they start writing nonsense and the YouTube algorithms pick up on keywords that are problematic for my channel that, you know, bring it down on the ranking. So uh, if you want to chat, I encourage you to join $4.99 a month to help support the creation of the content on the channel. If you don't want to, that's cool. Keep watching for free. Uh, you can also super chat. You don't have to be a member. So davi has got a super chat here. He says, uh, does being an alpha automatically mean having high SMV? and vice versa. I think an alpha, generally speaking, has a higher sexual marketplace value than a, a beta would in mm -hmm. most circumstances. Would you agree? I would say generally, that's the truth. Yeah. Um, however, don't think that it's mutually exclusive. So if a guy is alpha and he has a, a an alpha mindset, um, that does not necessarily mean that his, you know, maybe his physical SMV is pretty low. I've, I've met a lot of guys who are like unattractive guys, but they still have that alpha, you know, killer instinct. Um, so I, I would say generally that's true, but it's not always true. Yeah, it's not, it's not going to play 100% of the cases. So uh, call number is 323-642-1618. Uh, well, so I'm running a text to win contest uh, this month only. Uh, so if you text EIC to 40691, you'll be entered into a draw to win a one-hour coaching session with me. Uh, there's some consolid consolidation <laughs> consolidation <laughs> prize for those that do not win. So get on the list. Uh, it ends on uh, June 1st. Again, so text EIC to 40691. You get on the list. And just smash that thumbs up, like thumbs up button if you're watching. That really helps me out a ton. Let me go to the first caller here. 
Um, so when I put you live, what I'll do is rather than saying the area code, I'm just going to do the exchange and just give me a name. It doesn't have to be your real name, but give me a name so we know who we're talking to. So 367, I'm going to throw you on live. All right, 367, you're on. Can you hear me? Yep, you're up. Yep. Hello? Hey, Rich. Hi, Rolo. I uh, just wanted to kind of ask this question. So the best way to frame it is that, you know, I guess when I was, you know, very much so blue-pilled, I would say close to the age of maybe like 22, 23, kind of when I'm getting out of college and I'm starting to just kind of get on my own. Um, you know, I would deal with, you know, a couple of chicks I was really interested in in blue-pilled fashion. And one thing that I didn't do was, you know, I would never trust my gut feeling or I'd never kind of trust my intuition or even my emotions. But now that I've, I've read so much material, I've kind of gotten a lot of, you know, advice and I've pretty much embraced the red pill. I've learned to kind of like, you know, trust that, you know, my emotions and my intuition a little bit more, you know, but Rolo, you know, or even, you know, you, you too, Rich, like, what would you guys, you know, how, like, what's your advice in best kind of using that intuition to like make decisions? Um, Cause you know, like, I guess, you know, when it comes down to the red pill, you know, we understand that women are emotional and that they kind of trust their intuition. But like us as men, how can we, you know, trust our emotions and our intuition to, you know, kind of utilize it within a red pill lens uh, sort of perspective? I don't know if that the emotional component is what you want to rely on, but it's that, mm -hmm. it's that little voice. It's, you know, it's going to come from your gut. It's going to be something in your head that's just going to nag you. It's just going to be a little whisper. It's going to be like... Hey man, you sure you want to do that? It doesn't really look like a good idea. It looks like there's some red flags on this one. Come on, man, think this one through. Like, you know, just put some thought into it before you go and do anything, right? And it's real quiet. And then you'll only hear it when it becomes a shout. But usually it becomes a shout when you're going through the divorce machine or you're going through a oneitis or you're about to kick the bucket and you got a noose around your neck, right? So you want to be attentive to it as early as possible and, and not let it get to the show. What are your thoughts on that role? All right. I got a couple of things. Um, and you probably have read this post. It's not in any of my books. It's called gut check. And I think you and I have talked about this before, how, um, most guys sort of have this instinctual, uh, mate guarding instinct. Like when a, when a woman says, I want to go on a girl's night out or me and my girlfriends are going to go to Vegas this weekend. Or is that okay with you? Your gut automatically goes, Hmm. I know what happens on these things. And so that's why you have all this conflict and you call in and ask us about it. Um, but the thing is, is I, and I've written four different essays about this recently, just like within the year. And um, they explore the, um, the processes, the interpretive processes of instinct, emotion, and reason. In fact, that's the name of the, of the, the series. And the way I see it is that human beings have um, three three different ways, but they they coincide with one another. They have three different ways of interpreting their environment and the stimuli that comes from them. And the first one is instinct, and that's the one you're talking about right here. Now, instinct is sort of subliminal. It's it's below the surface. Some people want to say that it's you know if it's up in your face or something that it's a it's it's uh, it's on top of the surface, but it's not really because there are certain aspects of our behaviors that we do just instinctually, like we do it reflexively. So if like a fly or something comes at your eye, you know, you, you instinctively flinch, that kind of stuff. That kind of behavior is instinctual because it's a protective measure. Um, uh, one of the, another thing that we do is we try to be as conflict averse as we can be, right? We, we tried, we, we would rather not get into confrontation. And so we kind of shy away from those things. So we have to train ourselves to stand up for ourselves, right? So when you go and you, you're doing like martial arts, your instinct to do certain things. If somebody throws a punch at you, is to you know get out of the way or something. But if you can train yourself so that your instinct is not just the natural one, but the one that you've already instilled in your brain, so that you have muscle memory and you you understand what you're going to do in those kinds of situations. The same thing for like combat training and things like that. Um, so there's the instinctual side of it. There's also the emotional side, which is also how we interpret information. Um, so once we've got past the instinctual level, we have the emotional level and remember emotion is uh, a physical based, uh, way of interpreting our surroundings. It's not some magical spiritual woo woo thing. Okay. It's, I can, for instance, I can make you feel a certain way if I put oxytocin into your bloodstream, 
if I put more testosterone into you, I can make you feel you, your libido will go up and you maybe you'll feel a little more aggressive, those kinds of things. So there's ways that I can make you feel different ways that are, have everything to do with like your your hormones or your endorphins or your dopamine, whatever, um, to make you feel a different way. So emotion, when we finally see something in our environment, we, we think, how does that make us feel? And then finally, there's reason. And reason takes time. You have to have experienced something before so that you can remember what happened the last time you saw this phenomenon and what are you going to do about it now? Or you have all this information. How are you going to process that information? Um, for guys, it's usually instinct, reason, and then emotion. And for women, it's instinct, emotion, and then reason. And what you're talking about right here is how do I use that? How do I use the instinctual side of things? And you need to have a, I think, a better link or a better facility between your instinct and your reason. Because most guys, like we, I've always said, we, we teach boys as if they're defective girls. And part of that training is to train them to process like a woman would. So it's instinct, emotion, and then reason. And that's what guys tend to do because we're supposed to be in touch with our feminine side and our emotions and everything. Um, so you need to push aside the emotions and bring to the front your reason. So after you've got through the instinctual side, if something feels like a red flag, if something feels out of place, one of the reasons we feel that way is because our subliminal is saying, there's something going on in my surroundings here that are out of place. You know, red flag, look at this, look at this, you know, trying to get the conscious mind to to realize maybe there's danger. Danger is an easy one, but maybe there's something that's out of the ordinary in your peripheral awareness that your instinct is trying to tell you. What you need to do then is you need to bring that straight to your reason so your reason can say, okay, this is a true signal or this is a false signal rather than how do I feel about this? You know, so, No, don't do that. <laughs> you need to bring, oh, I think most men need to really train themselves to be more, uh, go from instinct to reason and then reason it out and then see how they feel about it. See how the emotional side of it is. And one of the things I think guys need to do is they need to have a circle of men that they can rely on to run shit up the flagpole mm -hmm. to see if they're going to, you know, salute it. Um, every guy should have that network. I don't know where you're going to find it, my friend. And you know, I put you on mute because I just want to move to the next caller so we can get through this because we got a bit of a, a lineup. But you certainly want to have guys, you know, in your circle of influence that can look for things yes. sitting potentially in your blind spots. Definitely. You know, if you've ever ridden a motorcycle before, you always do a shoulder check before you, you know, before you do a line, a lane change, because quite often between where you can see peripherally and where the mirror looks back, there's a, a large blind spot that a car or a truck or something can sit in that you could potentially lane change into and get run over. So, um, you know, as a guy that's ridden a motorcycle for 12 years, I've, I've, I've become good at uh, doing shoulder checks whenever I do lane changes. Um, the other thing I wanted to give you as well, as far as a resource, there's a guy by the name of Philip McKernan. Uh, who really helped me kind of tune into my intuition. And I've linked his channel in the chat there. It's uh, M-C-K-E-R-N-A-N. He's an Irish guy, very small channel, but he knows exactly what he's talking about. He's very well regarded in the space that he's in. He's kind of off the radar, you know, he's off the grid, but check that out, the channel's there. He's got a ton of videos. You'll, you'll find lots of them to be quite useful. Um, so thanks for that question, uh, 367, gonna... Get you off the lines. We've got another one here coming up. So exchange 472. I'm going to put you on. If you can just give me a name, first name, something to work with. All right, you're on 472. Who are we talking to? Uh, hi there, uh, Richard. So hey, Richard. And Rolo. Hey. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Go ahead. Name so we know who we're talking to. Oh, okay, cool. Really appreciate you guys uh, taking my call. I'll try to keep it as short as possible. Uh, going to the discussion of uh, beta conditioning, I'm in my uh, third week of recovering from an intense uh, breakup with a mentally unstable feminist. And uh, two major red flags I could have avoided, but I chose to ignore. And I, I would like to let you guys uh, kind of dissect that and try to see um, how I could uh, get away from that from that conditioning. Was that uh, the first one was the major red flag was that uh, she was in constant uh, contact with her ex husband. And when I would question her about why she would be in contact with him, she was sort of like uh, uh, essentially blaming for being insecure and jealous. And I would discover that she would change the name of the ex-husband to another name, and then she would continue to flirt with him and text him and all that. And she would just continue to berate me with like, you know, like accusing me of being jealous, and it only aggravated the situation. And um, another thing, too, is that... Um, she would also uh, start to, um, she had like, a lot of like, uh, 
um, mood disorders. Like she would also take a cocktail of like a. Oh, did we lose him? I think we did. I think I knew where he was going with it, though. Yeah. Um, yeah. It looks like we lost him on the line, so I'll just hang that up. But uh, he was he was talking about getting divorced from a feminist that kept in touch with her exes and manufactured a front, you know, the cloaking system where, you know, if she's talking to a guy by the name of uh, Rolo on Mm -hmm. her phone, she would call uh, Rolo Rachel or something like that, you know, Mm -hmm. for example. Right. Yeah. Um, With something else. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So that's a little bit bizarre, but what are your thoughts on that behavior? I mean, that's definitely a a big red flag. Yeah. I mean, there's something wrong with that chick. Um, I'm glad you figured it out. Uh, I, he didn't say how long he'd been with this girl, but it doesn't sound like he was all that wrapped up in her. And he was wise enough to, um, or I should say dissociated enough to see the behaviors so that he could get out. And that's, that's important because a lot of guys, because they're betas, because they're blue pill condition, they look past that. Like when you always talk about like red flags, like, oh, isn't this a red flag? And it's, it's really easy for us to sit here as a third party and see this behavior and go, dude, how did you not see that? Well, because guys are locked into that beta blue pill conditioning, a bit beta mindset, they, they desperately want it to be their ideal. They want to force fit her into that, even though she has all of these, you know, red flags about her. And so once you find yourself in, you know, sort of treading quicksand there you don't you don't make any progress from it because you can't because she is the ideal she's the one that you want to get with yeah um i think i got the line reconnected so mm-hmm. i should have you guys back on the line if it did drop uh the call-in number again is uh three two three six four two one six one eight and let's see if we can grab this next caller here okay blood talks give me a hard time here and it's I use Skype for the dialing. Give me a second here. Mm -hmm. How do I switch over to this? Boom. Okay, there we go. Um, So who do we got waiting? We got 551 on. Let's put 551 on this line here. Hang on a sec. Rolo, do me a favor. Just cover me, cover for me for a couple of minutes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. Well, I can I can talk about that last call a little bit too. Um, the guy when when you're in wrapped up in that, particularly when you're with the BPD, and I'm not saying that this girl's BPD. She probably had some other things that were going on going on with her as well. Um, what I found interesting is that we, you know, since we're talking about instinct already, the guy's gut instinct is, was that something was not right because she was. Um, you know, seeing the ex-husband or contacting the ex-husband. Um, so there's probably a little bit of the alpha widow thing going on there. Um, but yet she wants to keep this guy on the, on the hook. So you have to kind of look at things as a lot of people have been giving me grief recently about saying, well, the red pill is just like this horrible, um, objectivist, um, you know, point you know perspective of the world that just sees like human beings as machines or as animals or whatever and it's like no that we don't but you have to step up just because you're stepping away from it and you're looking at the behavior from a particular you know behavior as you know cause and effect a lot of people think that that's dehumanizing Mm -hmm. but i don't really see it as dehumanizing as much as it is important to understand you know so you can see these red flags it would be very hard for me to see red flags in my own wife right now for 23 years. So if something was going on or something was happening, I would have a real difficult time doing that because I trust her implicitly. Um, But because I'm red pill, my instinct tells me certain things. Like I was telling you about that one, uh, that one instance in gut check where my wife was driving somewhere early in the morning and I didn't realize she had an appointment with my daughter or something like that. And I I'm off to work and suddenly I see her car go by. And the first thing in my brain is, What's she doing here? You know, what's this all about? You know, and it was that instant suspicion kind of thing. And I felt bad for it later. But then after a while, I go, you know what? I shouldn't have felt bad for that because that was, that means that my instinct is working. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You definitely want to know that it's on. All right. Well, let's take a stab at this again. So, 551, sorry about the hole. Let's try this now. All right. You should be on. Can you hear us okay? Hello. Yeah, there you go. Go for it. I can hear you. Hey, uh, Rolo Richard Cooper. Um, Quick question. Um, I had this uh, past relationship with a with a chick that I think tried to like trap me in a way. Cause like when the relationship started, like you know, banged her like the the second day. You know, don't wait 
for more than three days, banged her, and then like she wanted me to move in because I was like kind of homeless at the time. I mean, our family has houses, so it doesn't really like matter. But I don't like to pretty much live under someone else's roof. So I moved in with her for a little while, and um, like I would say around like the fourth fourth month mark. She uh, comes to me and says that she's like pregnant. But before then, we we already talked and we discussed that you know I'm not ready for a kid. I'm trying to have a kid, and if if it was to happen, uh, we got to take care of it. And it was my fault for you know not wrapping up. But you know, anyways, um, long story short, end up making her well not really making her like we had an abortion, and after the abortion happened, she kind of was like. I guess like distant and pretty much upset and she became very passive aggressive. Mm-hmm. So we ended up breaking up and now my life is a little bit better. I mean, I started my own business and yeah, doing 10 times better without her now. But I just want to understand like, like do women get upset after, you know, they don't get what they want as far as like a baby goes? Well, women get upset in general. Well, they don't get anything. Yeah. Got to do with a baby or anything. I mean, how how old was she? She's twenty four. Okay, and how old are you? Um, I'm twenty seven now. And okay. you were unemployed and homeless at the time. I actually no, I was actually employed. I actually uh leaving, um, moving out of my place with our roommates. Uh huh. And. People weren't paying bills and stuff, and I wasn't gonna continue putting up my my money. You good looking guy. Bills, so just let everything fall apart. You good looking guy. Yeah, I mean, I get him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so there you go. Like early twenties, alpha C. Doesn't matter if he's got a house or not, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a that's a good example of that. Um, I would, yeah, I would just to answer your question is well as i can here um i think that you know just what rich was saying before she probably wanted to lock you down with a kid um and then decided that maybe that wasn't the best idea but the decision had already been made um that's why i always say abortion is the ultimate expression of hypergamy so what that means is that because she has this ability to sort of it's a fail safe for her to 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 have an abortion so essentially what she did was she decided that you she didn't want to be tied to you for a lifetime for whatever reason. And then after that, I'm sure she probably regretted it. And that's that's what happens with abortions is there's a lot of bad feelings that happen along with that. For as much as women like to say that we are going to celebrate our abortions and we're going to go march in the streets and pretend like we're all happy about it. The real truth of the matter is, is that it can be very psychologically damaging. She pretty much wanted the kid, mm-hmm. and I, I wasn't I wasn't ready for it financially. I wasn't in no way, shape, or form ready for it. You know, mm-hmm. she fought me tooth and nail, but I had to really come to it with like a basic ultimatum: like, if you want to have the kid, then I'm gonna sign over all my rights. And and she was just pretty much like, okay. And ever since then, it's been like, mm-hmm. yeah, she thought she was gonna be able to turn you into something that you weren't ready to be turned into. Yeah, and you got to. I mean, it's a it's a pretty uh, traumatic experience for a woman to go through something like oh, that. Oh yeah. I mean, it's not like just going down to the store and grabbing a coffee and you know walking home. Yeah, uh, so yeah. It's change the dynamic of the relationship. Pretty. It's a it's a hail mary for you, man. I mean, it's a, a lot of guys don't get to you know they can't talk, especially nowadays. You sim- if a woman sees you as a good long term prospect, she's probably going to have the kid. And even if she doesn't and her, you know, the alpha seed side of hypergamy kicks in, she might still have your kid and then try to have somebody else come in and be a single mommy and have some superhero come along and raise your kid for you. Um, it sounds like you are a little kind of confused about this or you, you might be having some bad feelings about this too. Am I right? I mean, partially because like, uh, like other people, like kind of look at me as a bad guy, but it's like, you, like, you know, things that went on in the relationship, you know, she wasn't on top of her bills and mm-hmm. wanted me to, you know, cover 
Well, it's always, up, well, it's always going to be your fault, right? You know, because you're the guy, you know, you always have to man up. And if you yeah, don't. 100% responsibility, 0% authority. Exactly. Yeah. So it's like, you know, like it is what it is. You're, you're, you're actually lucky that she, she would have done that because the law and the and social order is all on her side. So what that says to me is that even in spite of all the incentives for her to have the kid, she still decided not to, because I think you were probably the bigger factor in all of that than anything else. So what is the iron rule again with being in control of the birth role? Ah, uh, that is, I want to say it's number five, but it's uh, all, always be in control. They, they call it birth control for a reason. It's because you're in control of the birth and that means always wrap it up. And I know you didn't want to. That's funny. We should, we were, I just, I was on Twitter not too long ago and I was watching, I read some article about, they did this, um, poll and I don't know how accurate it was so don't get on my case about you know standards but um, it was something like if the uh, the majority of women if they found a guy attractive they wouldn't care about the the condom or they wouldn't they would not insist on a condom if not you know uh, tell a guy not to wear it so it seems to me that the more alpha the guy is the more good looking the guy is um, the less women care whether or not he wears a condom correct she she didn't want to wear a condom and she didn't um she asked me for the relationship mm -hmm. yeah so she saw you as the prize she saw you as something she wanted to lock down and then realized after she'd been pregnant see a lot of women will do that they will they will try to lock down a guy with a baby i mean this is like the oldest story in the book um unfortunately she actually did it but there are actual forums of women who get together and collaborate to figure out how they can trick a guy into committing because he thinks that his girlfriend is pregnant yeah, there's and there's a black market for positive pregnancy tests right now um, so that they can do just that yeah. so and unfortunately there's a bit you know a baby's gone because of this so you know it's it's a it's an ugly vicious game is what it is yeah so it's incumbent upon you gentlemen to make sure that you're in control of the birth i mean right you know, you've only got a couple of different forms of birth control you can use as a guy. Um, she's got 30 something or whatever it is. And even then, I mean, if you don't know her, you really can't rely on her saying, just go inside me. I'm on the pill. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you definitely want to get your head around that so you don't run into scenarios like this. Because then you can end up, you know, calling in and being like, I kind of feel a little bit of regret around that. Well, then you're a statistic. Yes. Then you're a stat too. Yeah, exactly. So just be careful, guys. Just be super careful. I'm going to let you go, brother. Thanks for calling in. All right, man. All right, uh, we've got a bunch of other guys here. If you want to call in, folks, it is 323-642-1618. Uh, also, got a text to win contest uh, running until the end of the month. Text EIC to 40691. You're going to get on a text list uh, with a random draw for an hour-long coaching call with me. There'll be some secondary prizes as well announced on January 1st. Uh, let's go to the next caller we got here, 406. So exchange 406, putting you on. All right, 406, can you hear us okay? Yeah, this is Mike. Hey, Mike, thanks for calling in. What can we do for you? So I've got a question uh, in regards to soulmates. Um, I love your work. I uh, follow it. Uh, I'm a student. But when it comes to the idea of the soulmate myth, I, um, I would like to just respectfully disagree. And here's why. Um, I am a religious guy. I'm Catholic. But I'm also very metaphysical in some ways, and I definitely believe that the universe puts people in your life for a certain reason. Obviously, he's put me in y'all's life because I'm watching you and you're helping me grow as a man, and that's all fine and wonderful. There's a plan for everybody, and I think the great spirit, God, whatever you want to call it, does that, especially with the opposite sex. Because the women who I have loved deeply in my life, including my former wife, um, I felt like were my soulmates. And I believe you have more than one soulmate, but I, I definitely believe that because yeah, I, I, my notch count is around 100, 43 years old, maybe even over 100. <laughs> <laughs> okay, hold on a sec. Hold on a sec, dude. I gotta stop you for a sec. I gotta stop for a sec. So, okay, so you want to take us to task on the soulmate myth? But you're but you're lecturing us on the soulmate myth, even though you've got a notch count of over a hundred. Well, my point, yeah. Okay, I mean, we're all hundred of them your soulmate. No, absolutely not. That was okay. what I, I was about to say. No, absolutely not. Okay. 
but the ones that I've loved deeply and cared for and been in relationships with, that sort of thing, I do feel like we're put in my life for a reason and we're soulmates temporarily. You know, I think we've got more than one. I probably got more out there waiting on me. I think that and you just so it, that really basically negates the idea of a soulmate there yeah, because but, there's more there's there is no one. There are good ones and there are bad ones, but there is no one. Yeah, like you just disproved your entire theory by <laughs> I was gonna say you just kind of let me I, okay, let me let me just throw this out there real quick because I am currently writing a book about the red pill and religion. And this was actually something that I wanted to get into at another like when I was doing my red pill and religion show. What if what if I told you that Jesus Christ himself said there is no such thing as soulmates? I can prove it to you scripturally because, and I, I wish I had, I, actually, I got it right here. It's uh, Matthew 22, 30. Okay. Um, do you remember when the Pharisees, or excuse me, the Sadducees went to Jesus and they said, if there is a man who has a wife and the man dies and then his brother is supposed to marry his, his wife, his wife, and then this happens seven times when they get to heaven, who gets who gets the wife? Who is the actual soulmate? Is it the first guy who married the the woman, or is it the seventh son or the seventh brother that married her and gets it? And so what what does he says? He, this is what Jesus says. It's um, he says in the or excuse me, he says you are mistaken because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God. In the resurrection, people will neither marry nor be given in marriage. Instead, they will be like angels in heaven. So. That right there says to me that there is no marriage in heaven. There is no soulmate. And as, as bad as that says, and I, I subscribe to Christianity as well, but I have to accept that from a scriptural sense. My wife will no longer be my wife when we get into heaven because it's, oh, it's above and beyond that. So that's one scripture that I'm reading right now as, as a part of what I'm writing for the fourth book. And there's going to be a million people, a million Bible scholars that are going to call me up and, and, and take me to task on that. But to me, from a red pill perspective, remember I'm writing about religion and the red pill. This is Jesus Christ saying, in the resurrection, people will neither marry nor be given in marriage. So what that says to me is there are no soulmates. Well, what about on this earth plane? Like, forget about eternity. I'm talking about well, what what's what's the point then? If you're you know if if they're if you're not going to be I and other people will disagree with me because a lot of guys in the in the Mormon Church, uh, like I think it was Tanner 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 told me that uh, people in the Mormon Church believe that when a couple comes together and they and they produce children that they are together in heaven for forever. Like that's the that's the religious belief. So one way or the other, the thing is is that according to you know, it's my belief is this, is that the soulmate myth is very damaging. It's damaging because it, it makes guys believe that there is only one, f one thing for them. And they're taught this because it is a, it's a basis for socially enforced monogamy. Correct. And here's the thing though. It's not damaging to Mike because he's accepted that his notch count of a hundred leads to many soulmates, different versions mm -hmm. of soulmates. Right. Well, and that basically confirms exactly what I said. Exactly. Yeah. But, you know, but for like a beta that's got the one itis for that one, that's where that's where it becomes exceptionally damaging. But for this guy, Mike, he's like, yeah, I've got a notch count of 100. I'm sure I'll find some more soulmates along the oh, way. I mean, and then, you know, the recent with with Roosh having his recent religious epiphany right now. I mean, how many yeah. how many women has Roosh been with? But OK, but the past is, is put away. Right. I mean, you're you're forgiven of all your sins. You're forgiven of all the all the chicks that you nailed back in the day. As long as you accept you say that you, you pray these words and suddenly all of that's gone. OK, even if you believe that, is there still such thing as a soulmate? And my my answer to that is no. There are there is there is no one. There are good ones and there are bad ones, but there is no one. And although my wife and I are a very good fit, and maybe there's something woo woo metaphysical to that, that doesn't mean that there aren't a few hundred other women out in the world somewhere that I could also be a very good fit for. And people don't like that because they really cling to the soulmate myth because they want something special. They want something because there, I, I, I don't believe then this isn't Christian. This is like, um, I, I think it was the Greeks used to believe that like that humans were like half of one whole. So a man and a woman created a whole being. And that I think is really another mythology that is used to enforce monogamy, it's socially enforced monogamy, and we do that on we do that socially, we do that legally, we do that religiously to enforce this idea that men and women need to be monogamous with one another. Yeah. All right, Mike. Thanks for calling in, man. Thank you all. Yep. 
Thanks. Good night. That was a good one, man. That was, uh, Oh, I'm on top of my game when it comes to religious stuff, man. Throw it at me. I, I, that's all I've been living in for the last year and a half. <laughs> you, should, uh, you should actually have uh, my boy Conk on uh, for a show. Yeah, of- you know, I, 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 he emails me, and Conk's in the sh- in the chat right now too. I, I definitely want to have him. I think I'm going to have him on uh, Religion and the Red Pill. Yeah, you should put him on at some point because um, we do these hangouts in my men's community, and he's in there, and, and like he's very well versed. Like he would, he would certainly be able to. Uh, okay. keep- you on it sure so certainly take them up if you want let me uh grab another caller here all right uh we got 414 on the line so exchange 414 all right you're on 414 what's uh what's the first name just give us any name i'm jack what's up jack hey how you doing so i have this question i'm recently divorced and uh i've been talking to two females and uh they're within my uh smv and uh recently two days ago i met another girl that she's probably, um, I would say I'm a seven. She's probably like a nine. And uh, she's interested in me, but I have a fear in the back of my mind, like getting through to her and like being nervous talking to her. How do I get through that fear of talking, which I have no no fear talking to the other two, which is pretty simple for me. But since the girl is hotter, mm. I have that fear in the back of my head talking to her. What's that? Um, uh, Chateau Harcisse had the 16 uh-huh. Ignore yeah. her beauty. Yes. Ignore her beauty. That's it. Yeah. Ignore yeah. her beauty. You just have to look past, you know, the fact that you've labeled her a nine and put yourself as a seven puts you at an incredible disadvantage because you're not going to operate very well in that scope. Um, you got to look past the beauty and just mm-hmm. and just do your thing, be on your purpose. You know, you're chasing your excellence. You know, if she toes a line and 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 compliments your life or, or compliments your frame, or even if it's a one night stand, whatever. Um, you know, you just kind of move past that. Um, but I mean, like the minute that you bend the knee, which you are at this time to her beauty, um, you're going to have a hard time operating within that scope, man. Like you're, I mean, you're just at a disadvantage, right? Like I'll just say it straight up. Yep. Yep. So I'll, I'm going to, I'm going to throw a few things here at you. Um, this actually refers back to a, um, an iron rule that I have and I believe it's number eight, right? Yes. Okay. Here's Iron Roll Tomasi number eight. Always let a woman figure out why she won't fuck you. Never do it for her. Okay. An integral part of maintaining the feminine imperative as the societal imperative involves women keeping or uh, keeping women as the primary sexual selectors. And this applies definitely to, you know, women you find gorgeous. Okay. Um, As I've detailed in many prior comments and posts, this means that a woman's sexual strategy necessitates that she be in as optimized a condition as her capacity, her attractiveness allows her to choose from the best males available to satisfy that strategy. So what a lot of guys do is this, and they're doing exactly what you're doing right now. And that is she, you're, you're taken aback by how hot she is. And you believe you, you, you haven't said this yet, but you're probably about to say this is that you believe that she's out of your league. And a lot of guys will say that women will even reinforce this too. And the reason they reinforce the idea of leagues is because they don't want a guy getting out of his lane. I'm sure you've heard that, that, response before as well like stay in your lane um they that's why women don't want guys who are uh smv five fours and fives approaching them when they believe that they are a seven or an eight um that's where you get the the guy who's really hot in the workplace and and he says hey looking good Susie," and she's like you know and then when the the creepy guy the the smv4 guy comes along and says exactly the same thing she's like hr you know, <laughs> and so what that is is it's a it's this belief from women that that only guys sh- who are worthy of her of her SMV should have anything to do with her. But guys will do this too, is they will they will kick themselves out of uh, out of a league because that's what they they believe in. And I'll tell you right now that I've seen guys um, learn game who can punch above their weight right they can they can go and maybe i don't know if they could necessarily if they were a seven could they get a nine i don't know but they could probably get an eight depending on on how how good they were um a lot of guys think well it's just about how good you look and how much money you have and everything it's like well you know a game is very important a game can be a balancer for your you know sexual strategy if you are good enough at it so um 
what you need to do is get out of your head that there are any, there is anything called a league. Okay, I'm going to read this to you as well. This is from uh, the 16 Commandments of Poon. It is commandment number 10, which is ignore her beauty. The man who trains his mind to subdue the reward centers of his brain when reflecting upon a beautiful female face will magically transform his interactions with women. Those who lose their awe of beauty will, in turn, lose their powerlessness under its spell. It will help you acquire the right frame of mind to stop using the words hot, cute, gorgeous, or beautiful to describe girls who turn you on. Instead, say to, to yourself, she's interesting. She might be worth getting to know. Never compliment a girl on her looks, especially not a girl that you, are, that you aren't already fucking. So those are a couple of things to, to think about. Um, you need to start training yourself out of this idea that there's anything called a league and go for it. I mean, half like half of good game is irrational self-confidence. You already have two girls that you know are productive. I mean, you, you, you've said, you said you're at least spending two other plates and you said that you didn't have any problems with them, but you having a problem with this other girl because you still think in terms of leagues. And I'm not saying that those leagues don't exist, but they need to. You, you need to take those, take the idea of leagues out of your brain, so that you will approach, so that you will get in there, and so you will try. What? And I'm gonna say, I'm gonna quote this correctly this time because I misquoted this last time. Wayne Gretzky used to say, "You miss 100% of the shots that you never take." So take those shots and stop thinking of things in terms of leagues. Yeah, that's the beta male that's holding you back. Can I ask man. you something? Go. Shoot. Uh, my ex-wife, I'm sorry. Yeah, my ex-wife, she was same thing. She was uh, a few notches hot, hotter than I was. Mm -hmm. would, it have, would that have to do something with the way I feel now? Yeah. So, like, oh, for sure. For look. sure. Yeah, you're still stinging from rejection. That's another thing. Well, I mean, hold on a second here. Because, I mean, like, I'm starting to question whether or not you got a good measurement system going on here. Because women don't typically marry down, right? And you're saying she was a couple points higher than you. Right, like it's very well, uncommon for women to marry down. Mm -hmm. So, why do you think that you're a couple points lower than your ex-wife? I guess I have low self expectations. No, that's well, that's yeah. something you. Yeah, here's the good news: that's something you can work on. Something to work on. Yeah, like mm -hmm. that. Like that's low self worth, right? Yeah. But, yeah. but. But by means of example, but by means of the actual action of saying I do in marrying you suggests that she saw your value at at least equal to hers, right? But you're placing yourself lower mm -hmm. than hers. And it's it's very, very uncommon for women to marry down. I know there's women out there that will be like, oh, women don't marry up and women aren't hypergamous and blah, 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 and all that sort of stuff. And the only time that they marry down is if their SMV is very low. Yeah. Right. Or, or there's some sort of, yeah, it's, it's their self-esteem is low or there's some kind of mitigating circumstance. Just like I was talking about with my, my brother-in-law, like he knocked her up. So they had to get married. Say that again, Jake. All right. Can you say that again? Can you just repeat that? Oh yeah. I said she knew her self-worth. She knew what she, she knew what she was. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so she, she knew she was high. So she she's, was, she defeats you in the mind. Yeah, exactly. So that tells me that your value is probably higher than what you think it is. But that, but that leaves a lot of room for you to grow. Right? How like, old? How old are you, man? Mm -hmm. How old are you? I'm 27. Okay. How old is the? How old is the ex-wife? She was 22 when we got married. Okay, so younger, older. Okay. Go well, uh, here's here's the good news. Also, is you're not even into your sexual market value peak years yet. So you still have a lot to a lot of room to grow. You're clearly red pill aware. So the good news is, is that you, your best years are ahead of you. So make sure that you make the most of them. So you want to build yourself up both in self-esteem and in sexual market value. Make damn sure that that's what you're driving for and you make yourself your mental point of origin and you find what you're ambitious about and you stick with that. Because right now, and well, actually probably up till now, you have the, the girls that you are with and particularly this one that you think is a nine, she is in her prime sexual selection years and she you and probably accurately you think that she um she is the one who's deciding whether she's going to go with you or she's going to go with somebody else or whatever but once you get to be in your once you get to you know, you're hurting you're hitting your mid 30s assuming you've made the most of your potential you will be in a prime sexual selecting position so kill off that beta <laughs> yeah that too all right man thanks for calling in will do thanks guys all right peace thanks a lot
All right, let's drop that one. And okay, let's go. Let's see if we got any chats here. I got to deal with. Hold on a sec. Oh, we got a new member. Welcome, Marcus. Hey, hey. joining. What's up? All right, uh, let's go back to the call lines here. So let's go to eight one zero. Uh, exchange 810 i'm gonna throw you on all right give us a uh, name 810 you're on hello going once hello? going twice oh, there there is. okay do you have a question <laughs> go go can you guys can you guys hear me yes we can okay i'm actually not 810 i was the 414 i think but okay uh, hey rich and roll what's up yeah, I'm a recent uh, Red Pill <clears throat> initiate here. Watch your your show regularly, and mm -hmm. now I'm reading uh, Sean's books and Rolo's books. Uh, I just got out of a five year relationship where I was blue pill foolish, foolish enough to put my high income on Match.com, and now I believe I was targeted from the beginning. Um, so, about four years ago, we moved in together, had a little girl. <clears throat> Thank God I never married this woman. Uh, but I'm becoming an expert now at cluster B personality disorders. So I, I could have easily been zeroed out there. You know, this is kind of after the train wreck, and I'm trying to mitigate the damage. Of course, you know, once I caught her on video, coming home, falling down drunk at four in the morning with some guy in my driveway, I confronted her about it, and she said, oh, he's gay, you know, all this gaslighting. I uh, denied it, and I said, we're done here. So, of course, now I'm getting dragged through family court. All this work on the subject to disengage and say, you know, no contact with a BPD narc histrionic. But of course, now the courts want me to co-parent with this, you know, ex-psychopath. So any advice on minimizing, you know, her opportunity to manipulate, kind of drag me back in, surviving the family court process and raising a sane little little girl into a productive daughter. How old is the child? We'll figure out who the sane parent is, but. You know, how do you deal with, you know, a BPD narc that you now have a child with? All right. So how old is the child? Four. Well, she's three. She's, she's three. three. She's she's going to be four in December. Okay. Mm -hmm. and she's just a, you know, beautiful little girl and my, you know, pride and joy. And what state do you live in? Wisconsin. Is that hostile towards men or is that equal? Well, my guardian ad litem is hostile. I can tell you that. Mm -hmm. Okay. She didn't like men. And like me, <laughs> but I got to research her all day long. Are you um, heading down the path of uh, shared parenting? Like you guys going to do shared custody or is she fighting you on that? She wants full placement for max money. It's yeah. all about the money. Okay. She's unapologetic mm -hmm. about using my daughter as a cash machine. Do you guys live in the same house still? Are you still in a matrimonial home or do you live in separate uh, residences? No, no. She Once I caught her on this video, I um, told her she's got to get out. I, uh, you know, She immediately filed a restraining order and started this domestic abuse narrative, which mm -hmm. was dismissed and denied because there's no proof and that never happened. But she's continuing down this path and it's the only thing she has to hang her hat on in court is that, oh, he's a domestic abuser and that's going to carry into his raising of the child. Well, that's losing steam. So and she's getting frustrated. So she's going to up her manipulation. So do you have access to, the, to your daughter? Like, do you see her much, or do you not see her at all? Or where are you we at? Do. With that? We have a we have a shared uh, placement, almost equal right now for the time being. But um, keep that up. You know, even the guardian last time tried to make a recommendation that she get primary placement with the mother and set a, a tone there. Mm -hmm. And thankfully, again, my lawyer, you know, stopped that from happening. Yeah, this is going to be a long battle for you, man, because she's going to do everything that she possibly can to try to get, you know, uh, primary caregiving rights to the child just because it gives her all the decision making capacity and, and then all the money flows. To right. Her, right. Mm -hmm. So, right. I mean, she's going to use the child as a pawn. You just have to accept that it is what it is. Um, you need to maintain a shared schedule. So whatever the status quo is where you guys are on, like, you know, your Monday, Tuesday, she's Wednesday, Thursday, and then you like alternate weekends, you know, sort of thing maintain that and if she tries to go outside of that you document it and um you know you protest with your lawyer I'm anytime she right breaks now it because of these false accusations that i have to wear a body cam on, on yeah. hand, custody handoff Jeez. yeah dude it's like standard right i mean like when you're when you guys when you get involved with a bpd you do not knock up these crazy ones okay like like i mean obviously it's a little too late for this gentleman but this is exactly why you do not get, knock up a bpd check because this is the kind of shit that goes down it pisses me off 
But anyway. I mean, I found out later, Rich, that, you know, she took all the kids' clothes. Yeah. And I'm, I'm like, wait a minute. Uh, you know, these are clothes that I paid for. Okay. She said, actually, I had a lot of those dresses b- before I even met you. And yeah. I'm like, oh, that explains a lot. Yeah. Okay. You had this, so, your, this is a game that you had in mind a long time ago. Yeah. Okay. So listen, guys. So, you know, without spending too much time on this, because I want to really focus this show on before the train, like, like trying to avoid. So let's take this as an, well, example, an example of example why you don't. Do it. Yeah. 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 Keep these guys awake. Tell, tell Serve them. as a warning. <laughs> so, personality disorders. Sounds like Rolo has some experience with that as well. Exactly. So this is why we're going to use this as an example to, to kind of demonstrate what you have to deal with. Because now this guy is going to burn through a shit ton of cash and time while he watches the court system chew up all that money and the lawyers, by the way, uh, who will profit from yeah. the acrimony you know, between the two of them to drag it out as long as possible. And who pays for all of this? The kid at the end of the day. The kid is the one that's going to deal with the outcome over a number of years. It's probably going to have to be a lot of work that he's going to have to do on his end to rebuild it. And even then, he's still going to have to deal with the relationship with his child's mother as a psychopath until the child's an adult and can figure it out for herself what a nut bar mommy is. So, I mean, the advice that I can give you, my friend, is just stay the course. It's going to be hard. Make sure you maintain self-care. You go to the gym, pick up heavy shit, put it down when you don't have her. Make sure you don't get yourself in an environment like this where you get drawn into the vacuum of a BPD psychopath and knock up another one. You got two kids from two bit, two different baby mamas. Then you're going for round two. And trust me, I, I've, dude, I've, I've, I've right, well, talked to men that have done it I'm over and over again. again. I mean, I'm glad I got a kid out of it, but uh, all the stuff that you guys are, are teaching is, How old you know, you? is uh, really informative, very helpful. So I want to thank you for that. How old are you, man? I'm, I'm 50. 50. Well, oh, wow. Okay. Th- three three year old at fifty dealing with this shit, guys. Oh man, you need to be careful. Okay, this is the why. road just got that much longer. Yeah, the road just got that much longer. So, my friend, you know, well, I'll tell you this again, guys. I didn't marry her, and she doesn't have any access to the resources or the right. assets. Yeah, so it's just about child support at this point. And uh, she's out now. Her money's gone. Yeah, she's taken out a loan on er- anything she has. So you know, I would, and, and maybe Rich can correct me on this, but I, I, I don't know how to do this. But would it not behoove you to like watch her like a hawk and look for any reason to, you know call her for being a, a alcoholic or for being a drug addict or whatever and getting primary custody of your girl eval that she's got to go up against next so mm-hmm. yeah so i was going to suggest that i mean if you give her enough rope she'll probably hang herself um just make hang sure that right. you've got a way to document that right? <laughs> well not literally <laughs> yeah, like, literally like she's gonna kick the bucket and hang herself like um how old how cat. old is the how old is this girl 43 Okay. Her SMV is going right down the toilet, so she's getting desperate. Did she have any kids before you met her? She did. Oh, uh, dude. Not very, I mean, he, she never got a dime out of that father. What are you doing? <laughs> she's a professional mother is what she is. She's a professional mommy. She. It's a cottage industry right now. For some, for some women, it is. It's like, let's have a kid with this guy. He looks like he's got some money. Divorce him get with another dude, have his kid, divorce him. And what does she have to do? Nothing. She just lives off of child support for, I mean, I'm not saying every chick does that. I'm saying professional mothers do. Dumb to take it that far and, you know, wind up screwing around, obviously right in front of my, my eyes with another guy. I mean, sure. Um, you can try to go for the lottery win here, uh, but you're going to spend all your money doing it. And I just found out from my PI that she's filed bankruptcy twice in the past. And, you know, did that successfully. Well, that's not enough states. to take the kid away I from her. I think she's going on bankruptcy number three now. Yeah. yeah. Well, if she's, if she's bringing home party boy, fuck boys in the middle of the night and she's lit and, you know, at 43 years old. Yeah. What you got to do is you got to demonstrate yeah. that she's an incompetent parent. Yes. And that's got to tie around alcoholism. Right. Um, like even having a rotating door at the front of her house with a tornado of dicks going in and out of the house every night probably w- will not be enough. But it's got to be something like incompetent in the sense that the child's at risk. Alcoholism, drug abuse, um, you know, like a, like a filthy house with no food, um, you know, stuff like that. That's Those are generally the things that you want to key on. Uh, just just real quick question before we let you go. Was the pregnancy planned or no. was it a trapped uh, pregnancy? No. no it was trapped? Planned. So yeah, what happened just so the guys can learn something from this? Yeah. Yeah, 
I mean, all of this in retrospect, I, I knew nothing about cluster B personality disorders. And then when I saw a list of what, you know, mostly NPD, narcissistic personality disorder checklist, she is a poster child for it. Abandoned by both parents, yeah. mother's a raging alcoholic, father was just a philanderer, never home, never got the attention of her parents. I bet the sex was amazing though, right? Better. <laughs> I bet the sex was amazing anyway, though, right? Thanks, guys. How was the sex? Well, at first it was, sure. Yeah. yeah, wild child. There you go. Yeah, and a lot of fun. That's how she got you. Girl. All right, man. Well, thanks for calling in and sharing the experience. I got a bunch of callers. I got to let you go, okay? Yeah, yeah, you bet. Thanks, guys. Thanks, brother. Take care. All right. All right. There's exhibit number 567, why you don't get with uh, it. Yep. God damn, man. Can you imagine being 50 years old? Like, okay, I'm 51, right? Imagine being like my age and you've got a three-year-old kid and you've got all of that ahead of you again. My daughter just turned 21 in April. I cannot imagine going through that yep. at, at my age. I, because you'll be, literally, you'll be 70 years old when, when your daughter is finally, you know, out of the door. Yep, yep. Unbelievable. Yep. That'll, that'll shorten your lifespan by a few years for sure, going through all that. Mm -hmm. All right, we got like 15 more minutes before we're going to wrap up tonight's show. Uh, let's take a few more callers. We got, uh, now... When I say exchange, the area code is in brackets. The exchange are the three numbers after that. So exchange nine four zero. I just don't want to identify the city or the, you know that you're in. So exchange nine four zero. You're going on the air. All right, nine four zero. Just give us a uh, first name to work with. D. D. All right, D. What's your question? Um. Thanks to you guys. Uh, last year, wife cheated on me. Uh, got a divorce. I took the red pill. And now I've moved on, got another female, a lot of things are going on. Now she's trying to come back and, you know, trying to squeeze her way back in, but I won't let her because I think she's finally realizing that things aren't going to work out, but I'm red pill now. I'm, I'm, I'm not a beta, but the guy she is with is mm -hmm. he does everything for her. So what do I do to tell her that? me and her are never going to get together again. You're divorced, right? Yeah, I'm divorced. Definitely. But and so she, and I, she's hitting you up again. She's coming back to you. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. She keeps hitting me up, trying to come back. Alpha widow. Okay. Block how her. How old is she? How old are you? Do you have any kids together? Uh, I'm, I'm 44. She's 39. Do you have any kids? D? Yeah, I got two kids with her though. Yes, with her, yes. Okay, so I mean, you're kind of obligated to stay in touch, but I mean, yeah. uh, look, once you're out, I mean, <laughs> Rolla, what's the iron rule about, you know, taking the trash to the curb? Yeah, never never root through garbage once you've taken the garbage can out to the curb um, because what you think you will have is never going to be what you think it is. Um, <clears throat> guys will do this a lot is they'll think, well, now I'm red. Here's, here's what you're doing right now is, is you think, okay, I'm red pill now, and so things are different with me. And so I can go back and I can make this work again. And you don't take into consideration the reason why it didn't work in the first place. You just think, okay, well, now I'm a badass, so I can go and make this thing work out. When the real, excuse me, the real question you need to be asking yourself is, is this even worth it for me to even go and do that? Because nine times out of 10, the answer is no. Uh, you say, well, what, wouldn't my kids want to be with their with their biological dad? Well, yeah, they're going to be because you are going to be an involved parent regardless. But even if you got back, I, I usually ask guys this, and it's not just like guys who are married, but like guys who broke up with a girlfriend or whatever. And they say, oh, I want to take her back. Or I want to find out some way to get back in with her. Um, I usually tell them this. I say, what is the best case scenario that you see between you and her, if you guys got back together, what I mean, just and just go hog wild, like, well, we're gonna be together and we're gonna get remarried and we're gonna go to Jamaica and we're gonna have a great honeymoon this time and all that old stuff that we used to talk about that made us fight all the time. That's that's not gonna happen anymore. I'm at the gym all the time. I look better. Blah blah. You just run down this list of the most idealized relationship you could possibly have with this woman, and then at the end of that, you say, is that really something that's possible? Could that even in, in your wildest imaginations, could that ever happen? And the answer is almost always no, because you still, even if you got back together and it was good, you still had that time where you guys got divorced. You had, still had that time where she went and picked up with some guy who was beta and she learned her lesson because 
you know, <clears throat> she she got with a guy who she thought was going to be this really nice guy, and she ke she keeps calling you, and she'd become an alpha widow over you. There's that time that all that happened, and there was the reasons that you got you guys split up in the first place, and those are still there. That's still the 800 pound gorilla in the room while you're trying to imagine that it's it's not there and that all is forgiven, and you don't you know it's it's it's, it's one thing to forgive sins; it's another thing to forget sins. And when you think about all of the things that she had, you know, that led up to that divorce and maybe it's, and maybe it's not on her, maybe it was on you. Maybe you just, I don't know what the, the details were between your split, but regardless, there's always going to be that time where you guys split up. So it's always going to ruin that sort of idyllic, you know, ideal of what you're going to, what you would be able to attain. So my advice to you and to every guy is that it is time better spent looking for new prospective women than it is trying to repair a relationship with somebody who already knows everything about you and they know your personality and they know what your mom's middle name is and they know you know you, know, you guys have had kids together for crying out loud i mean you saw a shot you saw two children come out of her uterus okay so there's you know there's that familiarity with her and maybe that's why you're considering this right now i mean i don't know if are you considering getting back with her uh no <laughs> oh okay the girlfriend I have right now, she's like 22. There's no way. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. So there ain't no way you're going to get back. with. Okay. So what's the problem then? I mean, is, are you just, I mean, you still have to have some kind of contact with her, but I guess you're trying to figure out how to, how to put her on ice. Yeah. So what's the problem here? Like let's, let's say I got a magic wand and I can to, wave it. I'm trying to tell her I'm not interested, but I don't want to piss her off at the same time. It's, oh, so she's proposing and like getting with you. I don't want us to be hostile. Yeah. So the way that you deal with that is you just um, only deal with issues surrounding the kids. So business, business you, only. Because you know when she comes at you, hey, remember that trip we took in you know 2007 and blah 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 and all that sort of stuff happened. You do not respond to that text. You do not even acknowledge it. The next text that comes in dealing with the kids, planning the birthday, that's the one that you respond to. You ignore everything else that has to do with anything that doesn't have to do with the children, and then she'll she will get the signal. It might take her six, seven, eight months, but I'm guessing you're the one that ended the marriage like you left. Uh, she cheated and moved out the house, but I'm the one who filed the divorce. Oh, she's a real piece of I'm work. I'm the eh? one that's been distant. Yeah, okay. Well, well, you're doing the right thing and you're going about it the right way and you're moving on from it. And it's good that you don't have one itis for her or, or that you're even considering taking her back and you got yourself your little uh, upgraded, you know, brand new model. So good for you there. Just, just, Dude, like, stay the course, man. Just head down. All off. business, all the time. All business, that's it. You know, anything that that has to do with anything old or her maybe trying to rekindle old, like, old ass shit, ignore it. Just, you know, you don't respond mm -hmm. to the email. You don't respond to the phone call. I mean, if the kids are with you, for example, and she's calling you, you have no reason to answer that phone, right? I mean, like, the kids are under your care, right? She can leave a text message. It's probably not even urgent. So you have to demonstrate by your actions. Make sense? Okay. Uh, makes sense. All right, Thanks, man. guys. Thanks. All right, what do we got here? We got nine more minutes left. Let's see if we can get another caller to it. All right, let's do it. Let's do it. Lightning round. Let's go. Yeah, let's go to exchange 885. Again, this isn't the area code 885. So you're going on. Give us a first name to work with, 885. You're on. Joe, what's up, guys? It is DJ Redfield here. How All you right. guys doing? What's up, Good. Good. What do you do for you? Yeah, yeah. So uh, I saw my ex, uh, Richard. I told you guys last week, man. And I asked you about um, how to keep away from your ex at like parties and stuff when you know she she wants to see you and stuff. Do you remember that? Uh, vaguely, dude, man. But I talked to so many people. So just give us like the distilled version, like the ten second update. Yeah, yeah. Long, long story short, man. Uh, I dated the girl for three and a half years. Uh, became red pill. Uh, she was a um uh, left her but i'm still like got a bunch of feels for her and uh, i saw her for the first time in a couple months at a party and uh you know i'm, I'm doing pretty good like everyone saw me djing and stuff. oh you're the dj uh, okay got it yeah but, yeah. Uh, I, 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 yeah 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 so i saw her and uh she didn't say anything to me at the time and i did kind of like wave her over just to like say hi kind of acknowledge the elephant in the room you know mm. But uh, she um, didn't say anything back to me and refused to come over to me. And uh, after the music festival, 
I was DJing, she called me and uh, I didn't answer and she left me a voicemail that just said basically, uh, I'm sorry I didn't say hi to you, um, let's talk. So what do you guys think her intentions are for reaching out to me? Well, she just, dude, I mean, she's just trying to check out to see if the grass is greener on the other side now that she's checked out the other fence, right? Mm. I mean, she's gone over to the other yard. She's checked it out, and she's kind of coming back, going, oh, "Let me see what this guy's got going on." That's all it is. But I mean, again, like you've broken up with her, so you know, yeah. back to that, back to that, you know, taking to the trash, trash out to the curb. Move, move on, man. There's, there's better things to involve you're, yourself in. You're a DJ, right? Like, you're a DJ. I, I was gonna say, man, there are no other chicks like, at your gigs. <laughs> what is so special about this girl? Yeah, I mean, like if you DJ, ended it. Yeah, but I mean, like, if you ended it with this girl, then you obviously ended it for a reason. Like, what's so special about her that you'd even consider rekindling it? Uh, honestly, dude, like, nothing really. I just didn't realize that she was, like, advice to men listening out there. If you think your girl is, like, a party girl or... Did we lose them? Oh, well, question for you, man. Like, did you oh. your life out of jail? Say that again. Didn't you meet your wife at a gig? Because you did, right? Uh, like, yeah, I did. Yeah, of course I did. Yeah, right. I, I, yeah. I met her at the place you're not supposed to meet quality women at, right? I mean, you're supposed to meet quality women at the library and Barnes and Noble and the coffee shop, right? Or Bible study, right? That's where. No, I, I was, um, I was at a gig, and um, it was up. I won't tell you where. It was in Northern California. Let's say that, um, and. Uh, she was there with her girlfriends. It was, she was on a girl's night out actually. Um, and she never, um, you know, she, she was, she never would go to this club like on normally because it was like kind of a rock club. She was like more into like sort of poppy kind of music kind of thing. And she was with her girlfriends and oh. I'm like wondering how much to divulge of this, but yeah, I did meet her at, uh, at a, uh, at a club. And so here's a question for you, Rose. So what mm -hmm. made, her like the one to marry versus she looked hot <laughs> she was uh she she looked like she was fun in bed to be honest with you and that's really all i was thinking about at the time when i was with her because i was sort of coming out of that um that bpd relationship i was already probably about four months out of of dealing with my ex bpd and oh. i was spinning yeah. plates and girl. she was which one was mrs tomasi a party girl at the time um, she was a plate that I was spinning at the time. Like she, a party girl, like, you know, drank. You know, mm, not, not a lot. She went out, she had, she had girlfriends, but she wasn't like, it wasn't like she was like getting out hammered and, and she was, my, my wife's always been kind of responsible. She, like I said, she comes from a very like, uh, conservative Christian family. And I know that that doesn't mean Jack, but that was something that, you know, she, she was never like over the, she never did drugs or anything like that. She never, I mean, she drank of course, but. So, um, Red Pill, let me ask you this. And what about your, you know, this girl that you're kind of talking to again, your ex? Is she like a big time party girl out, out drinking, doing drugs a lot at, at every night, you know, three nights a week? Uh, yeah, I mean, she was, man. Yeah, that's not really girlfriend material, right? I, just, I mean, like, uh, why do you want to bring that in your like life? That's hookup material is what that is. And he probably wants to get back to the, you, you want to get back to that sex because it's a sure thing. A lot of guys, whenever they want to get back with their exes, it's usually because they're sick of getting blown out or they're sick of the rejection and getting back with the ex is a buffer because it's easier because there's always that, there's already that history there and you guys have already had sex before and you think it's going to be different. It's not really because once you're done banging her, then you're right back where you started again and now you got to deal with her. So like a lot of guys, when it comes to, when it comes to the women that they have like preferences for, like, oh, I like to get with fat women or I like to get with older women or I like to get with girls with, you know, black hair or small tits or big tits, whatever. Those are usually the archetypes or the the beliefs of those preferences um, or fetishes um, are what has been successful for the guy in the past. So they will they'll go, OK, well, I really I have a preference for fat chicks. No, no, fat chicks are just easier to get with. Well, I have a preference for cougars. No, they're just easier to get with for you. And, you know, it's not like you're going to spend the rest of your life with a cougar. But uh, I think what you need to do is ask yourself why it is why it is that you want to get back with her in the first place. Um, is it just because you want to get laid? Well, if that's the case, then like 
focus your efforts on something else. You're a DJ, man. You're you're around other other people and other women. Why would you not use that to your advantage? Because I'll tell you right now, if you got back with her and then you're still a DJ and you're seeing all these chicks that are, that want to get with you, you're going to be pissed because you're like, damn, why did I get back with her when I got like, I could have had these opportunities with, with these other girls. That's what commitment is all about. Commitment is a limitation to your, to your options and it's a limitation to your ability to maneuver. So if you want to turn her into a booty call, I, you know, I wouldn't even turn her into a, a, a booty call. I would just let that go because there's, it's too high a risk for you to like get back into that old groove with her. Like do something new, man. Build something else. Make so, something new. Create. You know what? Blank canvas time, man. Go paint a new picture. A couple things for you, man. Like, first of all, when you're DJing, you're like you're up there, and you've got the social proof of the entire room that night. Like, you're probably going to be the highest value guy there, unless you got some baller sitting at bottle service, you know, blowing five or six grand with six girls around him, sort of thing, right? Like, <clears> you're <throat> the highest value guy there. So, of course, that evening when she sees you, she's going to have that, you know, those those like. Um, arousal cues you know going on ding, 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 you know like the gina tingle sort of start kicking off so i mean like you're going to hear from her from time to time of course especially in an environment like that but i mean like you've already talked about spinning plates you got a lot going on it's like you're not really that interested in settle down this chick's a total party girl so i mean just just move on man you know what i'm saying yeah I, i'm having a hard time doing that because i like to party a lot too you okay. know what I mean? I'll party with somebody else, man. I like to party. I can't just party. let's call that. Let's call up Andrew Tate, and you'll spend one weekend with Andrew Tate, and you'll forget all about her. <laughs> <laughs> all right, man. Thanks for calling in. All right. All right. Thanks, sir. See ya. Peace. All right. Bye. I'm gonna have to let all the other callers go. Apologies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you're calling in. I know uh, we could go for hours. Um, if I don't put an end to the 90 minutes, it you know it could go on. You you keep everything like pretty like on spot. When it comes yeah, to time, yeah. I'll give you that. You, you, I, I, I bow down to your greatness when it comes to that because we always go over. <laughs> yeah. Right, you know, it's ninety minutes. So, um, to kind of like wrap up the show tonight. So, first of all, guys, we got like a lot of people watching and not a ton of thumbs up. So, hit the thumbs up. Oh like, yeah, uh, I guess I should do that too. There we go. Um, this content that's worth showing other guys. Uh, the other thing too is you want to get in and access ahead of these phone calls. If you become a member, I always post the join link in the uh, membership tab for the community so you can join in and get ahead of everybody that calls in. So if you've got questions, not only do you support the creation of the content, you can chat and you can also, uh, you know, hit the join link and come on and ask a question that way so you don't have to sit in the line up there with everybody mm -hmm. else. Um, but again, you know, the show runs every Monday night. Uh, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, tonight, my uh, guest was Rolo Tomasi of The Rational Mail. You can find all of his stuff on Amazon. He's got a great book series. Of, I've, I've always encouraged everybody to read at least the first two books. He's working on a third book right now. Fourth. Uh, four, sorry, fourth book. Yeah, Paul. <laughs> um, make sure you follow him on social media. He's everywhere at Rational Mail or Rolo Tomasi. Uh, you'll be able to find him. And um, also does other shows out there on the interwebs. You do a show on Sunday night with Pat Campbell. Yes, I do. Red Pill 101 with Pat Campbell. That is 4.30 Eastern. Um, just go to my go to my YouTube channel and you can just sign up and you know get the notices. You know what I was also going to say is, and I'm, I don't sure you're aware of this. Maybe you are. Um, if, if you have people like, if you want to support the show, please go to all the support links, whatever. If you want to support any of these shows, go to the support links. But if you don't want to financially back us, take at least copy and paste the URL here sure. and then put it yeah, and share it. Because what that does is it puts it at Google, puts that in the algorithm and it, the more links it sees out there, the higher it's going to rank the video. So that helps everybody. If you go and you just a simple, just copy and paste it and put it in your Twitter feed. That's all it takes. Everybody says, how do I red pill my friends uh, by like sharing the URL? Also, by the way, sorry, I forgot to mention mm, share the, URL. the Grondike Soap Company, Tactical Soap. Uh, consider it. There's a link pinned in the description. You check out with coupon code Cooper. You'll get 10% off. If you're a bearded gentleman, you've got a lovely beard oil. This is actually a, a made. Got a little, uh, it got a little something coming in here. I don't know what it is. Coming in there, but I mean, you got yours. My Mennonite. It's my Mennonite beard. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. <laughs> great product. It smells great and it's very very good value too you know considering the other stuff that i've used in the past so check that out uh contest for text to win ends june 1st so if you didn't get in do it now text to win eic to 40691 we'll see you guys next monday at 8 p.m eastern standard time sean will be back thank you for joining me tonight rollo have peace. a good folks peace